Hi, I'm Ian Holmes, news reporter with Island Radio, also host of Head On here on Shaw TV. And I'm Hillary Eastmere, news anchor and reporter with 91.7 Coast FM. And this is a special edition of Head On Decision 2014. We've gathered four of the five mid Vancouver Island mayors, stretching from Ladysmith to the Oceanside region. Unfortunately, Qualcomm Beach's Tunis Westbrook couldn't appear here today. We're going to delve into the issues, challenges, and also opportunities for these respective mayors as they head up their communities in this new mandate. And of course, there were some common themes in the spotlight during the election, and we'll be touching on a few of those, including public engagement and spending priorities. And we'll see where they stand on some of the hot topics making waves in the various communities. I'll be sitting down with Parksville Mayor-elect Mark Lefebvre and also Lanceville's Colin Haim. And I'll be talking to Nanaimo's Bill McKay, but first I'll be sitting down with Aaron Stone as he prepares to take the helm in Ladysmith. joined now by Aaron Stone. He's going to be taking the helm in Ladysmith. Aaron, you were raised in Ladysmith, moved back in uh, 2003, and uh, just over 10 years later, you are mayor after uh, what some would consider to be a meteoric rise. There are some various organizations in Ladysmith. Um, yeah, so I, I returned in 2003 to my hometown to raise my family and start a business. Uh, started U4 Computers in 2003. Um, as my business and my family matured, um, became more involved in our community um, and started working towards uh, economic development through the Chamber of Commerce, um, worked on uh, some of the issues that we were facing with schools through uh, what we called the Ladysmith Working Group with School District 68 here in Nanaimo um, and other advocacy efforts that were kind of centered around either economic development or you know making our community family friendly. Yeah, so you were president of the of the Chamber of Commerce most recently. Yeah. Um, I guess a lot of people move to Ladysmith maybe to retire. You seem like you moved to, to get involved. Well, you know, the, part of the whole economic development discussion has been how to attract young families to our community. Um, over the last few years, we have become a retirement community, as many sort of the smaller communities in our region have become. Um, but we've looked at trying to find a blend between, you know, being uh, friendly and productive and a good place to live for our retirement community but also being able to attract young families that will uh, put down roots, start businesses, uh, participate in the community economic development, and uh, just take a longer view look at, at, at their place in the community. Um, my experience is not unique in the fact that some people that have um, come to some of the smaller communities um, with families tend to invest a little bit more, um, put down deeper roots, and can be really beneficial not only to the community but to the economy as well. And so some of the, the things that you ran on during your campaign, uh, public engagement was a, was a big part of it, mm -hmm. the idea of open government. Tell me a little bit more about uh, your feelings on that. Um, I've had ideas that go back long beyond my, my involvement necessarily in the community um, around open government. Um, there's been a, a kind of a prevailing attitude in the past that the more open your government is, the more difficult it is to move things along. Um, but my experience has been, especially in the last you know decade or so, that um, decisions and priorities that are set in sort of inside a bubble when they do become part of the public discourse um, can find a lot of resistance. So my opinion has been and my experience has been with all kinds of different decisions is if we include the community as much as possible throughout the process, um, when we get to the time to make a big decision, when people are informed, you're more likely to get a successful result. And I've used the analogy of um, starting, especially with difficult issues, when you have a molehill of an issue and you, you come out with it right away, um, it doesn't become a mountain of misinformation or speculation. Um, that can cause a real backlash when it does become a public uh, item of discourse. So um, for me, being open with government goes beyond just, uh, you know, ads in the paper that are legally required or notices on the website, but really engaging people on the level that they expect to, whether it's through your cell phone and Twitter and Facebook, um, you know, streaming and archiving public meetings and even facilitating the question period process online because especially in our community, we have very small council chambers. Um, our occupancy limit is 30 people so it doesn't leave a lot of room for the public to get engaged and, and building on that we've decided to look at uh, t a town hall meeting schedule um, not only with our council but with our First Nations Council that we work very closely with on a lot of cooperative projects um, to help build the connection between our neighboring communities as well as involving our area directors in areas G and H um, that really do look at themselves as part of Ladysmith even though they're not able to vote in our elections and making sure that when we come down to 
um, planning and decision making that uh, we've got a real inclusive look at the greater community and how it all fits together. Um, because whether it's budget priorities or, or community development, um, it is an ecosystem that really is uh, all tied together. So there's no easy answer to one issue without looking at all the broader issues that, that are related to it. Right, and by getting all of those different working groups together, you mm -hmm. think that decisions can be made, um, you know, maybe it may take more time to make that decision, but, but once it, you get to the end. Uh, it doesn't take more time if you end up with a successful conclusion, right? You can put a lot of investment um, in, in a project, and we've had some recent examples. For example, we had a, a boundary expansion proposal from Coverton, and it wasn't brought to the public in a way that the public felt engaged in it until it got near the end, um, and, it, and it resulted in an unsuccessful um, conclusion, meaning that we ended up putting a lot of investment of time and energy from council, government, staff, and the community to basically achieve very little anyway. We have spun some, some valuable um, sort of results out of that. We've done some watershed studies and things like that that have been valuable to our community, but the end result was a lot of investment for very little progress. So I believe that if you take the, the, the you make a greater investment throughout, um, you'll come to a more successful conclusion and one that might be more representative of the community's priorities as well. So you mentioned uh, town halls as a way of uh, engaging the mm -hmm. public. Uh, what other ideas? I know you're pretty active on social media. I, yeah. I'm sure you're going to plan to keep that up now that you're mayor. Yeah, and you know, I think that's unique. I, I, I haven't shut down my Facebook page just because uh, uh, the election's over. Um, I've continued to stay engaged with people, and even in a personal, casual way. I think it's important for people to understand who I am as a family man, as a person. Um, I posted a picture from one of my photo shoots where my hair flopped over like a comb over. People need to understand understand that there's a personality behind their public figures and I think that when you're able to connect with people on a personal level um, th they can kind of understand where you come from when you're looking at policy decisions or some of the more difficult things that we have to do as a, as a community and, and I think that people have to understand that I share the the love and desire for our community I'm, I'm not I didn't run for mayor because I wanted to be the mayor I ran for mayor because um, I belong to Ladysmith and it's an important thing for me and I think that if people can see that side of my personality um, and, and the way that I express myself, um, the things that I like and that I love about our community, um, when it comes down to tough decisions, and even if we don't agree, they can maybe understand where the perspective is. And, and, I, and I believe as a bigger piece, open government in general, <clears throat> if you can really engage people, leads people to understand that there is a value to a democratic decision that doesn't necessarily go your way. I'm sure that I'll be sitting at the head of the table and we will make decisions that as a group that don't fit my priorities personally, but I understand and I've seen this uh, to great effect with, with and not with some politicians that I've dealt with where we'll sit down on an issue and we agree and oh it's all rosy and wonderful but when we don't agree and we can leave the conversation respectfully we can come back together on the next issue when we do agree and it's a great interaction. Uh, it's important for people to understand that a democratic environment is that if you get 60 percent agreement you're in good shape so the 40 percent have to understand that hey it didn't go my way but it is sort of the will of the people right. Right yeah. and I mean Ladysmith is uh, it's a small place uh, if you yeah. you know you're, you're not going to be able to hide from the electorate, so to speak. Well, I'll, 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 just to recount, uh, going back several months in this process of kind of looking at this uh, opportunity, um, I met with Gene Crowder, our MP, um, just talking about a piece that I wasn't able to deal with. I've got this, uh, you know, character flaw where I feel like I need to convince people that we're all on the same side, so you should see it my way. And, and uh, understanding that when you're successful in a political type situation or community decisions, she said, could you imagine if 90% of the people are with you. 10% won't be and in a community our size is about 800 people. Well how do you feel about 800 people in your hometown that don't feel good about what you are doing. Well, the reality is, is we're more likely going to be 60%, maybe 70, maybe if you're lucky, 75. Yeah. So you can do the math quite quickly. The reality is, is that to take on a role like this, you have to understand that there are going to be people that don't agree with your decisions. And going into that with eyes wide open, I felt that this was the best way to engage people in a way that says, hey, you know what, I can respectfully disagree, even if the community doesn't go my way on a decision, um, and move on to the next issue. Well, let's talk about some of those tough decisions you're going to have to make with us spending priorities. Yeah. You've got uh, a big vision for the community. Uh, you've 
highlighted First Avenue as one of your, yep. your priorities. Of course, the waterfront as well, developing some of the industrial areas in, mm -hmm. in Ladysmith. What are going to be your spending priorities? Um, you know, I, I hate to look at it spending priorities because I am, feel myself being a bit of a creative, uh, a creative worker when it comes to making more out of what we have. The reality is, is municipalities across Canada, large and small, are under immense pressure when it comes to things like infrastructure, aging infrastructure that needs to be replaced. Um, there's a lot of burden on taxation on the homeowners in your community, the industry, and commercial areas. And without putting additional burden onto our community, we have to be a little bit more creative of how we achieve things. So for the First Avenue piece, for example, um, I did speak in my platform about uh, a community council is what I termed it as, but a group of community leaders that get together and, and work in conjunction with council to spin off working groups that can you know, find strategies to, to do some revitalization or, or reinvigoration, I'd rather call it. So if we look at, for example, the Chamber of Commerce, we have a downtown business association, both very active, very strong, but under their own funding pressures. You know, they're out there fundraising all the time just to achieve the day-to-day -day business that they have to conduct. So if we're able to engage them with the, our council and put together some plans together that require small bits of funding to achieve certain projects like the Chamber of Commerce it, it, as my role as president we had a, um, a business center where we were trying to identify business opportunities, commercial opportunities from a real estate perspective as well as business gaps within our offering within our community services and, and retail opportunities and being able to market them outside of our community to attract say a young family entrepreneur to come put down roots, start a business, fill in the gap for the people to enjoy but also to start that economic development. Right, because you have to grow that tax base in order to be able to pay for these projects down the road. Where, there we go, we'll get to those money? in a minute. Exactly, and without putting additional burden on taxpayers, and we talk about infrastructure pieces, amenities that people want, um, they're, they're not free. And, and the grants and the funding from our from our provincial and federal governments aren't quite what they used to be, um, although we are coming to another election season, so you never know how that might turn. But the, the reality is, is that there's more pressure on municipalities from a funding perspective. So without having to jack up taxes on people, which you'll hear universally, people People don't want and you know a universal message is that are already too high um, we need to be able to look at creative ways to to broaden that tax base and the only way to do it is to broaden your business base so for us we've we, we've done some analysis through the Chamber of Commerce and through um, our local government on what some opportunities are there and I think there's a lot of strategic alignment that we can come up with when we look at our light industrial inventory of, of real estate as well as with uh, with some of the um, redevelopment opportunities opportunities we have within our downtown business district that will help broaden that tax base and increase the revenues that will then be able to spin off into some of the amenities that people want. And that development certainly is a, is a hot topic in Ladysmith. You have that amazing waterfront mm -hmm. um, which I think you feel isn't being used to its fullest potential. Yeah well right now we have basically an uplands area and a waterfront area that other than Transfer Beach which is which is a gem you know it's a, a regionally known as being one of the best municipal parks out there um, and we've done a great job with that in our amphitheater, the events that go on there definitely dwarf the size of our community in terms of what we offer there in terms of cultural peace. But as you travel past that through to our maritime society, there is this sort of void of environmental issues combined with um, with some sort of land use issues that really haven't been addressed properly. And the environmental piece is a big part of it. So we, over as a community, and when I say we, I'm talking about you know past councils and, and our community have engaged with our First Nation uh, to come up with a memorandum of understanding. Um, that was kind of put in place in 2012 to say that we'll work cooperatively on the remediation piece with the environment um, and also in the visioning piece with that uplands area as well as our waterfront area. So we don't know how that's going to look yet. We take the official community plan and the waterfront area plan we had from uh, the early part of the, the century now, we could say, um, and, and really bring it into focus quickly over 2015. That's where a lot of those town hall meetings will come from. Well, and after we understand that, we'll be able to move forward on the economic development piece, which is, uh, again, a, a cooperative venture between our First Nations par partners and uh, our community and, and our council. Well, it sounds like you've got some exciting partnerships there, and you're yeah. uh, on, on the right path, and yeah, uh, it's sure. going to be an exciting four years for Lady Smith. Thank you so much Thanks. for joining me, Aaron right, Stone. thank you. And uh, next up, we're going to head over to Ian. He's speaking with Lanceville's Colin Haim. 
Yeah, hey, thanks a lot, Hillary. Uh, by no means a stranger to Lansfield, that's for sure. He was uh, the district's first and only mayor from 2003 to 2011, then was unseated by Jack DeYoung, who was then returned the favor from Colin Haim, who just uh, defeated uh, Jack DeYoung recently. Uh, Colin, thanks so much for coming on the program to learn a little bit more about yourself and, and what plans you have for Lansfield. Yeah. Um, yeah, like you said, in terms of, of being mayor, I was mayor, mayor from 2003 to 2011. Prior to that, involved with the Improvement District for uh, nine years prior to that as well. Um, it's been an interesting events over the past number of years. Certainly the, the uh, changeover of mayors back in 2011 was, was interesting both from my standpoint and from the district standpoint. But now things, uh, I'm back in the mayorship aspect, different council, different things to work with, but I'm looking forward to it. And it was a rather decisive victory for yourself, Colin. Why did the voters, uh, in, in fairly resounding fashion, uh, tap you back on the shoulder and have you back as Lansville's mayor. What, what do you think uh, was for that? Well, a couple of things. I mean, first off, there, there were three candidates, which Lansville has never seen, so that changes the voting dynamic somewhat. But when it comes to aspects and concerns, the water, the budget, um, there were some concerns there, and a big concern around the communication style of the local government and the information being given out to the residents, especially in relation to the water deal. Um, in terms of the the door knocking I did, that one came up on a consistent basis, both those people that were in the water service area and those people that weren't getting water. Now on the public engagement side, uh, I understand you do have a few different ways to, to open up transparency mm -hmm. at Lanceville uh, District Hall. Colin, just let our viewers know a little bit about what you have planned to just narrow that bridge between uh, district hall and also uh, the residents? Well, there's a couple of different things. Some of them are, are real basic, simple aspects. Like, for example, through the election, um, I had a cell phone that was specifically for residents to phone with their questions, their concerns, that sort of an aspect. And that's something I expect to continue. Um, certainly, there's there's social media aspects that, that Lanceville has never pursued in that. But more importantly on that, there's the engagement of the per people kind of face to face. Um, for example, having town hall meetings where, where basically the residents set the agenda. Um, it's not a council set agenda, so basically residents give input as to what they'd like to discuss and unscripted, kind of more of a round table, residents and council getting together, talking one on one in that aspect as opposed to um, kind of a more structured meeting where there's a specific agenda and the residents feel somewhat excluded. Another part of it revolves around the in-camera meetings as well. Um, certainly even um, back when I was mayor up to 2011, there was criticism with regards to the in-camera meetings and the lack of information that came out of them. It continued through this last uh, term as well. And so one of the things is, is a policy with regards to release of in-camera information on a regular basis. Now, from your, the door knocking you've done, Colin, or is this what you're, you're, you're hearing from residents, that, uh, that they're not getting enough information? Or what, what specifically were you hold on, on the information side yeah. uh, from the people well, you talk to? Well, part of it's just a, a question of trust. And so, for example, with regards to the water deal, um, the water deal with Nanaimo had been in, in uh, constructive phase for many, many, many years. Um, council had promised public consultation in regards to it, yet it came out of in camera five minutes or 15 minutes later, it was passed and that was it with no discussion. And so that builds up a level of mistrust between the residents and the council. So to, to help alleviate that, if residents are getting information on a regular basis, I think that trust can be rebuilt. I'm curious about uh, some of your, your priorities, especially from, from a, a budget standpoint. Uh, Colin, uh, it's well documented, Lanceville, uh, very slim industrial tax base, money is fairly tight, so taxpayers uh, in Lanceville, I've noticed it even compared to, to many other communities around uh, this uh, this area, are to pay a little more attention to how their, uh, their very valuable uh, residential tax base and property uh, uh, commercial tax dollars are spent. So from that, g given that, how how people feel like that uh, in Lanceville about uh, about their, their tax dollars, where where do you see your priorities for, for spending these very precious tax dollars in, in Lanceville? Well, it, when it comes to the spending side of things, uh, one of the big concerns that came up was a staffing aspect, the amount of money spent on administration. Because we are a small community, when it comes to the, the addition of even one staff member, um, is an addition of roughly about eight or nine percent 
to the to the actual money spent on administration. And so in regards to that, what we had previously was a model of contracting out. And so the idea was is that you could expand and contract based on the specific demands that were occurring, whereas when you bring in employees, they're there whether things are busy or not. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be one of the areas of review with regards to council or at least individual council members are interested in looking at that. Um, beyond that, um, certainly the aspects of our water infrastructure and those sorts of things um, need to be reviewed where we are in terms of the plan, where we're going, um, and then there's the basic infrastructure of roads and that whether or not they're being kept up because like you say, we do have that limited tax base, commercial and industrial. So in terms of um, contracting out uh, particular services and you want to have a little more flexibility as opposed to having these staff on year round. Colin, is that right, what we were right. saying? So for example, if, if you've got special projects that go on, like for example, OCP reviews, downtown revitalization planning, things like that, those are not things that occur each and every year. So to bring in staff members where you're going to have an annual bill for wages, it, it kind of forces government to almost create projects in order to keep them busy. And, and that's not, in my mind, the way it should be. It should be a case if a project comes up, you source somebody to handle that project project and then when the project's done they move on and the district moves on without having that commitment. Uh, downtown Lanceville it's been a, a conversation piece for a long time Colin trying to make it a little bit more desirable you get the density up and, and have uh, your, your storefronts uh, full a little more regularly. What, what do you see as, as some of the, the the things that should happen in order to, to accomplish a more viable downtown Lanceville? Colin? Well the, one of the keys is, is water. Um, the, uh, the consideration for example some of the buildings they they want to expand and increase their size and therefore attract more people to the village but they haven't been able to because of the limitations of water so what we see is is some aspect of water coming to the downtown village core which allows that expansion of it so it can create kind of that critical mass that can allow it to survive where people are attracted to it to they're going to come and shop there because there's enough being offered as opposed to um, effectively it's almost the same position it was when I came to the community 20 some odd years ago. Um, in, in sticking with spending priorities here, uh, sort of a, maybe a long-term capital outlook, if you will. Uh, what? Did, I mean, you've lived in Lance for a long time. Yeah. Do you see uh, anything that stands out at you that that, that you'd like to you know, put into to the long-term capital plan to, to invest a little more money uh, into Lance for, from an infrastructure perspective, Colin? Um. The one of the things you bring in infrastructure, there's maintenance required on it if there's new infrastructure coming. So we're we're very wary about that aspect. It's it's a case where we don't want everything for everybody when it comes to Lanceville. Taking care of the basics, the water, the sewer, which we've now had for a number of years, um, upkeeping those, made sh making sure those have been kept up. Um, we don't have a huge amount of infrastructure that requires that update upkeep other than those specific services. And I can't really see that that changing other than possibly some. Uh, 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 revitalization of some of the parks, you know, in terms of their usage and as the demographics demographics have changed, whether or not something needs to change there as well. Uh, you touched on it earlier. Uh, it's a big issue, water, and uh, a recently struck water deal between Lanceville and Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, how do you see the, the, this shaking down for Lanceville? Is it a good deal uh, for it, uh, the long-term uh, sustainability and, and improvement of quality of life in Lanceville, Colin? Yeah. Well, one of, one of the things I ran on was, was concerns related to that water deal. Um, there are residents in Lanceville who are on wells. They have issues with either contamination or low supply and that sort of an aspect over time. And literally, they cannot receive the uh, access to the new water. And so the agreement itself, the idea of the agreement is fine, it's great, it provides some future for those areas. The challenges are making sure it's available on some level to all of the existing residents before developers. And that's something that I definitely heard in the door knocking side. You go up to places where there's uh, five Canadian Water Springs jugs on the front doorstep and you don't have to ask them whether or not they're drinking water out of their wells and they say when you open the door, they say we're not in the agreement are we? And I had to tell them no they weren't. And so some tweaking of the agreement with the cooperation and discussion with the city of Nanaimo can make it an agreement where it can move forward and that's one of the, the short-term goals. Can you just clarify a little bit because with the, this new water deal coming in uh, for the uh, 225 Upper Lanceville homes and then uh, and, and 50 a, a year for this 20-year renewable deal, Colin, yeah. um, so there's a certain, there's heavy reliance on the, on the current community uh, water system in Lanceville. Does that, does the, the new water not free it up for those uh, other homes that you're referring to where they can, you know, tap into that 
available community water system with, with, with the new source coming in, hooking into the Nanaimo Pipes column? Well, first off, it's a question of location. Uh, Lanceville itself is basically split between upper and lower Lanceville, and our water system actually has two pressure zones. The access to water being provided or, or, or offered by the city of Nanaimo in relation to it goes to the upper zone. Within the water agreement, it says, for, with regards to those 50 new connections a year, it specifically says they can only be used for new development, subdivision and new construction. So if I live in a home that already exists and I don't want to subdivide, even though the pipe goes right front outside my door, I can't connect because of that specific clause. And so that's one of the tweaks that I believe needs to happen to the agreement, not to any detriment to the city of Nanaimo. Whether that 50 connections goes to a new house or whether it goes to an existing house, the same fees are required to be paid to Nanaimo. So Colin, are you saying we'll try to reopen negotiations here with Nanaimo and, and get that change uh, and, and sort of unlock the deal and get it back locked up again from, from Lancel's perspective? Is that, do you see that as something that, w- that, that can be done before the water really gets flowing here between the two communities? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to it, I, I view it more as a tweaking of the deal. Um, there were, and, and why those clauses are in there, to be honest, I don't know. I can't consider any rational thought why those clauses exist. If it doesn't provide any more issues with regards to the city of Nanaimo, but it provides a benefit to those existing residents in Lansville, from my standpoint, you, you'd wonder why somebody wouldn't agree to it. If it caused a detriment to Nanaimo, so it was a win-lose scenario, that's wrong. I believe it can be turned into a win-win because in its current form, trying to push it forward and, and actually have water flow doesn't make a lot of sense unless it gets to those residents that it was originally um, aimed at at the beginning. What does it mean to have uh, the, the dust has settled on this water deal? Yeah. Uh, we're told maybe about two years from now this uh, the, the water will be flowing between uh, Nanaimo and Lanceville. Yes. What, what does this mean long term uh, for the district of Lanceville? Uh, how would the, the, the district potentially uh, change? What are what are some things that residents can expect and what does this mean for the district as you see yeah. it, Colin? Well, go right back to the official community plan. Um, I was the chair of the OCP committee back in roughly about 2005 when we created the OCP and when we started that process basically our direction to the committee members was assume there's water and so the OCP already contemplates the idea that there is a water supply and therefore from that standpoint Lanceville should grow to meet the expectations of the OCP so village core renewal some seniors housing the ability of secondary suites that sort of a thing Lanceville doesn't desire to be the biggest but there are some shortcomings in our existing housing supply in that that need to be addressed to make it a more complete community. Colin, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's great getting this insight on Lanceville and really appreciate your time. You're welcome. That's Colin Haim. He's the mayor-elect in the district of Lanceville. Nice to get some insight on that small, beautiful seaside community. We'll now turn things over to Hillary Eastmuir in conversation with the incoming mayor in Nanaimo, Hillary. Yes, I'm joined by Bill McKay. Uh, Bill, you've often said that uh, your your first term councillor, uh, and you've said that that term was almost like your mayoral apprenticeship in a way. You've been uh, preparing to take on this role, and uh, luckily the voters thought you were the right guy for the job as well. Thank you. Uh, in fact, in fact, my apprenticeship was actually six and a half years because I spent three and a half years in the gallery. Uh, every Sunday morning, I would download the agenda and I would go through all of the items so I was fully prepared. I would sit in the gallery either with a printed copy or with my laptop and follow along and often wonder how I would engage myself in some of those conversations. So it's actually been about six and a half years. Wow, and so, so you've been preparing during that time, and uh, you ran on uh, on a platform of uh, of public engagement. Certainly, I know you were talking about uh, the the need for uh, an increased opportunity for people to have a say in what happens. You know, not just cast your ballot and then four years later have another chance to to um, have some input. So, tell me about some of your ideas for uh, public engagement. Well, we have to look at a number of different tools. We can't just do, uh, it's almost like marketing. You cannot market by using only radio advertising. You have to use a number of different tools. So we're looking at, at web engagement through our website and I was speaking to some folks in Kelowna here recently about how well their system is working there. We want to do more public forums and how about some of the old fashioned simple stuff like how about once a month having coffee with the mayor at a local coffee shop or a grocery store in addition to which some of the main some of the main uh, uh, mainstream items like town halls, newspaper advertising and just general conversations with the community. 
And in Nanaimo, we've been sort of delving a little bit into the, the idea of Twitter town halls engaging through social media. Um, I know you were, you were talking to me about the idea of maybe doing telephone polls to get uh, some input on some key issues. Certainly, what tends to happen is you have a significant portion of your community is not really that well engaged. So it would certainly be helpful if we can get a broader spectrum of voters and a broader sense of how they might uh, they might think on a particular issue. So we've got to use all kinds of tools, including telephone polls, so that you can go from top to bottom in your community. And in Nanaimo, we've had some issues around transparency um, regarding particular hot topics in town, um, and uh, some of those still still playing out. But uh, yeah, certainly situations where having more public engagement could potentially help reach a better decision in the long run. Well, I'll tell you, you, you have to engage early and you have to engage often. The other thing you have to do, in my opinion, is you you're so much better to start off with a blank sheet of paper. Start at a town hall with a, with, a, with a blackboard that's empty with the challenge at the top of the board and start having that conversation before you've made any decisions. That's going to be really important. And so uh, let's talk about spending priorities for the city of Nanaimo. Lots of big projects already underway, um, some uh, coming up on the horizon. Uh, what's, what's at the top of your list? Well, first off, we want to start giving some relief to the to the uh, to the taxpayers in Nanaimo. So, uh, w when we have our first budget meetings, we want to try and get this budget process over with as fast as we possibly can, so that we can get into a performance and services review, and have that completed by perhaps late summer, early fall. Uh, if it were up to me, I would say let's go with a zero tax increase this year and put our, any spending priorities we might have off till next and let's breathe for a moment so that we can get on with the important business of a program and services review. Okay, and I know the idea of a core review came up a lot during the actual election period. Um, so you're talking about similar, something similar to a core review, but a little more specific in some ways. Sure. A core review is, is pretty much a, a slash, cut, burn uh, sort of process, if you will. You hire some very expensive efficiency experts. They come in and tell you what you can and can't do and shouldn't and shouldn't do. And instead of asking your community what services they'd like, the program services review basically looks at number one, what services do you want the city to provide? Number two, how many resources do you want to put at each individual, put to each individual discipline? And number three, how do you want to provide those services? Either by public only provision, or private only, or public private, or perhaps even a combination of social enterprise and public and social enterprise. So there's all kinds of varieties that we can look at. Okay, and uh, we have some big projects that the city may have to pay for, so that's where, where that uh, tax base comes in. You, you bet, you bet. We're just in the process of, uh, of some of the capital costs coming down for our water treatment plant. At the regional district, we've also got consideration for a sewage treatment plant. We've got the concerns about what we might do with infrastructure in the south end of Nanaimo as that portion of the community builds out, particularly at the Ocean View and Sandstone project areas. And I think we've got some private enterprise that can help us out with some of those uh, some of those provisions of public services. What do you mean by private enterprise? Well, for example, Harmac has a sewage treatment plant that could provide sewage treatment for all of Nanaimo, and we're not tapping into it. And I, for the life of me, can't understand why. Uh, if I, I spoke to Chief Wesley today, for example, about what might happen with water provision and uh, uh, regional strategies surrounding water provision using perhaps Harmac's uh, water license that they currently hold, that of which they're only using a very small portion. Why would we reinvent the wheel, build new dams when they've got, they've got f water available? And you're speaking to the issue that uh, they say by 2022, Nanaimo will need to seek out new sources of fresh drinking water. Certainly. Uh, in fact, what's happening, I want to see a provision uh, going forward where we, we expand our water saver programs into the commercial and multifamily projects. Uh, we've seen some really significant water savings when we've uh, put forward some of these programs. So I'd like to extend those and see if we can't, if we can't uh, use that very precious resource even more effectively. Let's talk about the striking a balance between running the city like a, like a public service and like a, like a business. Because there, there does need to be a balance between the two. Uh, where do you think your council is going to fall on that? Well, I, I know that, that most of the council that I have have a very strong sense of social conscience. 
And so a lot of people say you need to run a city like a business. Well, a city is not a business. Certainly you, make to, you need to make very strong, uh, sound business decisions. However, sometimes there's not a return on investment. So for example, if you wanted to put audible crosswalk signals around a certain sector or part of your community, there's no return on investment financially on that, but it's the right thing to do as a city. And I could give you a hundred other different examples of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about some of the uh, some major projects in Nanaimo, which uh, also hot topics as well. We've got the uh, the fast ferry connecting to Vancouver, which uh, is on, on the horizon, uh, pending provincial uh, the, the province saying it is a priority project, so they can get that uh, Building Canada grant. Yes. Also got a couple of hotels. Uh, let's touch on the fast ferry. Uh, where do you stand on that? Oh well, in fact, I've been a I've been a I've been a booster of the fast ferry. As you might know, I was the operations manager for the previous operation, and while that operation was uh, capitally underfunded, we want to make sure that the new operation is not. In addition to which, the public demand for passenger only, or uh, passenger only services, or perhaps uh, not you know being able to travel without a car, is becoming more mainstream. So I think now more than ever is a perfect opportunity for this operation to take take flight. Mm -hmm. And of course there's uh, helijets coming to town too. And, right, exactly. I was going to say building into that sort of south downtown waterfront area, yes. um, you know, in the future could become a transportation hub, that sort of plan still up in the air. Yes. Now, with the couple hotels here in Nanaimo, that uh, was was on the on the minds of voters during the, the election. Uh, we've got the Conference Centre Hotel currently under construction. Where do you stand on, uh, on the lease of Georgia Park to the, the Hilton developers? Well, first of all, it's not the lease of Georgia Park. A lot of people would like you to believe that it's the entire park. Uh, that park is just under, uh, just under one acre. And the portion that the hotel would propose, and we have to remember this was done by negotiation between the two parties, that is about 250 square meters of that park. So. When you look at the overall development very carefully, you'll see that it's, it's going to be a great benefit to Nanaimo. Having said that, we're still going to go to the community to determine whether or not they want that project to go ahead. So you're talking about a referendum? Uh, there, what, what the community charter requires is electoral assent. Yeah, so it, either a referendum or that alternate approval process. Correct, correct. Those are the two tools that have been given to us by the province to use. And to be honest with you, uh, I would believe that rather than spend a significant amount of money, a, a referendum in Nanaimo is, is just over $100,000. So if there are a number of concerned citizens that suggest that they, they would like it to go to referendum, they've got a lot of work to do. However, if it's going to become pretty obvious pretty quickly to all of us that this is a hot button item for the community. It, it'll end up going to referendum. Okay, and what about the colliery dams? Colliery dams, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> goodness indeed. Yes, well, one of the things we have to realize is that Nanaimo has nine dams. And we have to be very, very careful of the standard at which we're prepared and going to force ourselves to present to the province. And that is, with nine dams, if it costs us $8.1 million, as we're being told right now, to bring that up to a standard that would withstand a one in 48,000 year event, we've got nine dams. Hmm. Or, you know, it, that's, if we're going to live to that high standard, we're going to have to do it with all of our dams. But specifically for the colliery dams, though, um, I, I know you've said that you thought this decision process has taken too long and you'd like it wrapped up by yes. February? Yes. End of February, we want to have this wrapped up. Uh, I spoke to Chief Wesley about it today, and we're going to sit down with them and we're going to review some of the, the, the potential uh, remediation and uh, other items that we might want to consider. I'm still a firm believer that we've got a great opportunity on the Chase River to manage water, not only in the heavy events, but also in the drought times. And that's an enviable position when we start looking at the Cowichan River and the Quinsum River and they had drought situations here this last year. We've got the opportunity at the Chase to manage that water. So we just need to maybe turn our focus to that a little bit and consider that it's all about how much water is presented to the top of the dams, whether they will or won't over to overtop. And you're talking about doing that through a stronger partnership with the Nanaimo First Nation? Absolutely, because under their Douglas Treaty rights, they have the responsibility of managing the fisheries. What are you most excited about uh, taking over as mayor? 
Oh my goodness, uh, it would have to be uh, economic development. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, we've we've caused a lot of problems for ourselves with respect to make, uh, presenting a friendly community to investment. And we have to do a much better job in A, going out there and seeking new investment, and B, making sure that when we do have those people standing in front of us, that we try to make it as easy as possible, remove the barriers for them so they can get on with their projects. Best one I can tell you about is, who would have thought 10 years ago, a company would knock on your door named Tilray to, to produce a product that they do. That pro project was the best one, the best example I could ever give about Nanaimo, fast tracking a project to get it through. And, and talking, that's the medical marijuana producer correct, set up at Dexter Correct, Point. we expected 40 to 50 employees. In mm -hmm. fact, we're seeing, right now they're talking about an expansion. Right now they're at 110 employees. And that's the, that's the path that we need to take, uh, as you were saying in Nanaimo, to develop those, those good paying jobs. Thank you so much for joining me, Bill McKay. And uh, next up on the uh, final portion of this special edition of Head On Decision 2014, Ian, sitting down with Parkville, Parksville's Mark Lefebvre. Hey, thanks a lot, Hillary. Uh, Mark Lefebvre, he's a very familiar face uh, around Parksville, 12 years as a councillor. Now uh, he's mayor as he takes over for the outgoing uh, Chris Berger, who is a very popular mayor in Parksville. Big shoes uh, for uh, uh, councillor turned mayor Lefebvre uh, to fill with with uh, Chris Berger gone. Uh, thanks for coming on the program. Really appreciate your time. You're Mark. welcome, Ian. Uh, from your perspective, you've got a lot of experience at the council table in Parksville. Uh, why why jump into uh, to the mayor's role and what uh, sort of uh, led you to, to, to uh, this new career choice for yourself, Mark? Well, I think that Parksville is at a very critical juncture in our, uh, in our evolution with the, I've sat on the uh, Aerosmith Water Services Committee for 12 years and I've been on the Englishman River Water Services Committee and with the, with the new dictates from the uh, public health regarding uh, the, the water quality standards, uh, this, is, this is going to be very, very important for Parksville Future to get a long-term sustainable supply of potable water. And I wanted, that was my main reason for, for running. That's, that's the number one priority and it'll be for the first five or six months until we find out what kind of funding we can get from the federal and provincial government. Uh, that's going to be a, a, big, uh, a big issue for us. Yeah, much more on that uh, water treatment and intake facility, uh, also uh, aquifer storage and recovery, which is a very interesting um, component to that project as well. We'll touch on that here in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, first on the public engagement standpoint, uh, Mark, I understand you have some ideas to try to, to reach out uh, to the community on, on a few different um, public interest issues and particularly a piece of property in downtown Parksville to find out what the community wants. Well, the, um, it's been disappointing. Like the, the, the turnout for voting this year was probably a percent higher than it was in the last election. And mm -hmm. you keep, I don't, know, I don't know the answer as to why. Uh, sometimes you say, and when you're looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, the answer for the low turnout is because uh, people are satisfied. If you take off the rose-colored glasses, maybe people are fed up with the, with the way things have been going and are just uh, tuned out. Um, I, with regards to my tenure as mayor, I would see us having a, a advanced notices, much maybe much larger advanced notices for public meetings that we want to have. For example, the land that you talk about, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and and possibly offering different options, having meetings in the afternoon, having meetings in the evening, to suit those that are working during the daytime and those that aren't working in in the daytime can perhaps come in the afternoon. Uh, and I, I believe in town hall meetings. I like to get as many people out as we can. Um, a good facilitator, uh, a, a calm and cool uh, type of type of meeting. Everybody gets a chance to to give their opinions and especially their ideas, because there are ideas out there, and we want to hear from. I want to hear, and I know that council want to hear from people. Yeah, the, the good example is that vacant lot that's bordered between Alberni Highway and Craig Street and, and it's on, Jen, on Jensen. It's almost two acres, it's about 1.6 acres. And it's been vacant for a long time. And uh, I, it's time now to find out from the owners of that property, which are the citizens of Parksville, what would they like to do with it? What would be their priority? And, um, and I, I would think that we can, we can organize town council meetings or, uh, yeah, town council meetings with, the, uh, with uh, the citizens of Parksville that we can get some ideas and get some preferences on that and then go forward and make a decision on what, what we hear from people. And um, I, I think that has to be done sooner than later. It's a valuable piece of property. And uh, in terms of its highest and best use, I, I think that um, we have to come up, we have a responsibility over the next year or two to come up with an answer as to what we want to do with it. 
Uh, Mark, let our viewers know a little bit about uh, some of your, your budget spending priorities, uh, priorities in general, some projects that you see that, that could use some attention in Parksville. Well, first of all, the uh, I said I said throughout the campaign that infrastructure is is my in my priority. Infrastructure gives us our standard of living; it gives us our quality of life. So the infrastructure program will be first and foremost uh, after water. Uh, then I think that um, part of the infrastructure program, we may have to move up certain. In certain parts of town, I'm uh, I'm convinced that we have to do more about downtown revitalization. I heard that from the voters during the campaign. They want to see uh, downtown revitalization continue. We've had the co-op gas station, the insurance company, all of this, all of the great buildings that are now on Well Street, and there's a few others interspersed here and there. And so uh, I want to have a meeting the, uh, with the Parksville Downtown Business Association. I'm going to be meeting with the executive very shortly, and we want to have a meeting of all the business owners downtown. And if part of that if part of the things that I hear is they want infrastructure changes made in the downtown well I'm prepared to look at that and I, I'd be prepared depending on the the impact on the infrastructure budget that for the rest of the city I'm prepared to uh, to look at that very seriously now, are, we talking, we are we talking about um, housing density uh, um, more allowances for larger buildings what kind of changes in well, infrastructure I'm, you know, talking I'm, about I'm talking more about the issue of sidewalks and roads and and you know the uh, the infrastructure the underground infrastructure with water and sewer and that sort of thing that that may have to be changed to accommodate certain changes that maybe a building owner would like to make. Uh, we want to pedestrianize the downtown more and more, so maybe we're looking at wider sidewalks and, and narrow, narrower roads. I mean, this is, this is just speculation, but that's some of the possibilities. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, revitalizing downtown, I know that Parksville has been looking to get, you know, just draw more residents, and, and there's been a few projects that have come up on, on the city council agenda over the past number of months, and on a, a few little apartments and condos here and there to draw more people into the downtown area. Uh, just how important is that? Any strength of a downtown is, is having people living within it, within yeah. a downtown core. No doubt about it. Densification is the name of the game. You have uh, um, commercial on the ground floor and residential on the top floor, and and we've uh, we've got a, we've got a lot of that now. We have it at the thrifty uh, the thrifty center. In town, uh, in the uh, where there's commercial on the ground floor and apartments on the top floor, and, and one of the buildings that as you enter off of Corfield, so that's really that's the name of the game. Get get more people living and walking and uh, shopping downtown, and um, and it coincides with. Um, with cutting back on traffic, you know, traffic is becoming a problem. Parking is becoming a problem in Parksville, so we have to be cognizant of that. But those are things that uh, that, I'll, that we'll focus on in the first year, first year and a half for sure. A couple of questions at a very well attended uh, all candidates forum at the Parksville Community Conference Center uh, revolved uh, around uh, generating high quality jobs in the Parksville area. It's it, it's it's a huge issue facing uh, uh, the community, and uh, and the Parksville District uh, Chamber of Commerce has a few projects on the go. They're working with uh, lifestyle entrepreneurs, uh, high-tech workers to, to, to try to push that along and bring these mobile workforce uh, into the community. Um, I, I know that's something that you're interested in, Mark. Uh, th this is a, a, a very serious issue that, that Parksville needs, needs to grapple. What, what can the city do uh, specifically to help uh, improve the, the job environment for high quality jobs in Parksville, Mark? Well, working working with our strategic partners like the Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Business Association, I think that we can, first of all, uh, make the city a more welcoming place uh, with uh, with, the com with accommodation availability that's um, that's appealing to somebody that wants to get into a lifestyle, has a lifestyle type of uh, requirement in terms of the job that they can do. High tech is something you can do anywhere, so obviously high tech is the number one, uh, is the number one priority. And the other thing is I like what the Chamber of Commerce is doing. They, they are appealing to lifestyle entrepreneurs. I mean, the, the lifestyle we have is, is fantastic. We've got every kind of activity, outdoor activity you can imagine for some 30-something uh, person who wants to, to, to live that way. We've got schools, uh, we've, got, we've got the Vancouver Island University campus on site, and uh, we'll be talking to them to see how they can participate and make that more appealing too, and looking at other strategic partners. But to come back to, um, to, come back to the Chamber of Commerce, the other thing we have to worry about too in Parksville is that there are a number of people who want to get out of, get out of their business, they want to sell, so they're looking at succession planning, and maybe that's that's another aspect that we can sell in terms of marketing through the Chamber of Commerce, marketing the, uh, the, Parksville, area, the Parksville downtown area especially for these people that want to, want to sell the business and retire. 
Okay, I'll get on to the, the Englishman Water Project uh, in a second, but a, a quick one uh, on taxes and fixed incomes in the Parksville area. A lot of folks are on fixed incomes and taxes go up every single year, all get fairly modest in Parksville over the last number of years. There, there is a crunch there, isn't there, there are mark uh, that aspect of things. I know it, it's obviously a concern. What is there anything that can, that can be done to, to, to maybe slow that increase or, or maybe get a freeze on property taxes in a perfect world? What do you see on that, Mark? What I'm committed to doing, first of all, and I've said this during the campaign, is I'm committed to uh, to making sure that uh, I will, if there has to be a tax increase, it'll be fully explained in terms of why. Uh, we are in good shape financially, so we'll have to look at that. But that having been said, uh, there is there is the aspect of um, of things coming up on the horizon. We've got a, a, a water a sewage treatment plant in French Creek that's going to be largely expanded and uh, and uh, ameliorated in terms of uh, what it what it can do now and what it needs to do in the future for future to to absorb the, the type of um, the type of uh, volume that's coming there. We also have uh, we know from our experience with the RDN that there's a major capital program going on with uh, the Nanaimo Regional General Hospital. And that's a, that's a lot of money. Uh, we've been told by Island Health that they're going to spend $300 million over the next 10 years. And we're going to have to pay for some of that. So it's it's a case of, of balancing those kinds of demands with uh, with what we can do and how we can stay with our infrastructure replacement and renewal program. Mm -hmm. But my commitment, I'll repeat, my commitment is if we have to raise taxes, that it'll be fully explained. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, from a reporter's perspective, I uh, certainly feel a little bit uh, sorry for Parksville's situation with this, uh, the, the water treatment situation with uh, uh, these federal water guidelines for surface water, more stringent water uh, filtration that needs to be done for surface water sources, and that puts Parksville in a very difficult position. Now you're slapped with a, uh, a bill in the $37 million range uh, for to, to treat the surface water, and no senior government funds have been uh, committed or, or even sort of hinted towards for Parksville, Mark. Uh, and you mentioned during the all-candidates meeting, hey, this maybe this is something that we don't go ahead with fully right now. If we can't get uh, the proper amount of senior government money to get this thing instituted, yet it has to be in place by the end of 2016. What? How do you solve uh, th th this very serious issue? Probably the biggest one facing the, the community right now, uh, clearly right now, Mark. It certainly is because water is so fundamental. Water is the new oil. You can't live without water, especially uh, in, in, the, in the kind of summers that we have. Um, I have said, and I, I'll continue to say that uh, this has been mandated by the provincial government uh, through uh, through public health. And uh, there's no quarter that this is what's going to happen. Uh, the water quality standard has to be brought up in, in terms of public health issues so that the provincial government is adamant about that. Uh, that having been said, um, we have received uh, some indication that there'll be some money coming. And uh, with the onslaught of the federal election next year, uh, we don't know. We simply don't know at this point in time. That's why we didn't hold a referendum on the water situation. We will at some point in time when we know what that is. But I'm committed to, um, to phasing it if, I, if we have to. If we don't get the funding that we need from the federal and provincial government, the obvious answer is you have to phase it. The problem with doing that, and we'll phase it over time, the problem with doing that is in the long run it's going to cost us more. But there's no, there's no substitute for water. I said to someone the other day that my, uh, my landline phone bill my uh, my uh, my internet bill and my um, my cable bill is over $180 a month. When when I consider my water bill is nowhere near that. So I mean, you can't live without water, but I could live with everything else. I could live without without uh, internet and cable and and, um, and landline phones. So it's it's very important to put it in perspective. Water is pretty key, and uh, we we have, so much depends on water in our town. And for example, in the summertime, this is why we've developed through uh, through our consultant the aquifer storage and recovery uh, concept, because we get low flows of water in the summertime. Our summers are a lot longer and a lot harder, and we have a responsibility to fisheries and oceans for the fish that are in the Englishman River. So uh, hopefully we can supplement the, the water flows in the summertime by by housing these uh, this water, this winter water that comes in in gallons and gallons and hundreds and thousands of gallons a day that we can we can harvest that into an aquifer storage and recovery which is simply a, an empty aquifer and then bring it out in the summertime to have more water flow in the, in the river. We'll, we'll track this situation closely Mark. Um, I've had numerous conversations with Chris Berger about this and I'm sure we'll have uh, many more uh, 
in the months uh, and years ahead. Uh, water, this issue doesn't stop even when this treatment plant comes online. There's the conservation perspective and also just uh, living with, within our means with, with Vancouver Island being such a, a desirable place to live. Mm -hmm. Mark, thanks a lot for coming on the program. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. That's uh, Parksville Mayor-elect Mark Lefebvre here on a special edition of Head On here on Shaw TV. And uh, Hillary, it was really uh, great to hear from uh, all these mayors uh, coming into our studios here uh, in Nanaimo to get a little bit more uh, insight about uh, the various issues facing uh, our communities. Uh, Bill McKay coming in from Nanaimo, Colin Haim from Lanceville, and also uh, Aaron Stone uh, coming in uh, from the town of Ladysmith. And uh, I hope you had just as much fun as I did. Absolutely, a great opportunity to hear from these four Mid-Island Mayors this evening. Unfortunately, Qualicum Beach's Tunis Westbrook couldn't join us this evening, but we did have a chance to hear uh, about uh, from Mark Lefebvre from Parksville, Colin Haim from Lanceville, and I spoke to uh, Bill McKay from Nanaimo and Lady Smith's Aaron Stone. Yeah, it was a great opportunity to learn about uh, some pretty pressing issues facing uh, these various communities. Public engagement was a big one. How do these incoming mayors uh, react to, uh, which is sometimes a, an apathetic public, uh, water issues, huge involving Lanceville and Parksville, that's also connected to uh, Nanaimo as well. Uh, there's no shortage of, of huge issues uh, facing uh, these communities here on uh, mid-Vancouver Island. Yeah, and it was interesting to, see, to hear how uh, growing the tax base is a priority for all of them because, of course, raising taxes, never a popular idea, especially as a, a new mayor. Oh, definitely. Uh, these are, you look at Parksville, for example, also at Lanceville, uh, not much of an industrial tax base there. People, uh, it really puts the squeeze on these various communities uh, that way. So that's, uh, that's an important component to have these communities grow, but also grow in a very smart way. This is, uh, we heard that these mayors talk about, these incoming mayors, about the importance of keeping the aesthetics of a beautiful community growth, uh, contained growth in a positive way. So that's uh, certainly a very key issue to uh, continuing uh, with the quality of life that we enjoy here on Mid Vancouver Island. And the need for good paying jobs. Definitely, that's a big one in Parksville at Nanaimo as well. It drives a lot of people out of uh, the Mid Vancouver Island area. There's no shortage of people. Uh, we, uh, I have several friends who head up to uh, Northern Alberta regularly for work and that's just, um, that's uh, need some more better jobs here on Mid Vancouver Island. Wave a wand, make it happen. Yeah, well, they've got four years to do it, and it'll be really interesting to see uh, see what happens. Well, I, I certainly hope that uh, voters stay engaged with uh, local politics and, uh, and stay informed. Yeah, thanks so much for tuning in for this special edition of Head On here on Shaw TV.